Wow. It's a big crowd. Let me see if I have this thing on. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I'm John Gates, the Associate Dean for Diversity and Engagement at UVA Engineering, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this, our first diversity salon. Today's event is in partnership with the College of and Graduate uh, School of Arts and Science, the Department of Sociology, the Carter G. Woodson Institute, and the School of Nursing. We're being hosted by the Curry School of Education, and I want to thank all of our partners for making this gathering possible. Our diversity salons represent a cross-sectional gathering of intellectuals from across grounds to explore deeply issues with which we as individuals and as a collective community of scholars must grapple. These diversity salons are intended to provoke critical self-reflection as we prepare for the university's third century. The question before us is how might UVA transition from being an inclusive institution to a fully affirming institution where the potential of every person to contribute to our greater good is embraced, celebrated, and supported. Accomplishing such a critical task requires that we not nip around the edges of our being, but rather that we engage in bold, creative, and deliberative conversations about our current and future state. The salons are part of our Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series, which was kicked off last week by three astronauts, Dr. Mae Jemison, Leland Melvin, and Kathy Thornton. Future events will include Thomas Page McBee, a noted columnist and transgender activist, Daniel Beatty, an acclaimed actor, playwright, and author from New York City, who will deliver his award-winning one-man show with 43 characters from slavery to present. Dr. Joy DeGruy, author of the book Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Dr. Claude Steele, former executive vice president and provost of Berkeley and author of Whistling Vivaldi. And there will be more speakers to be announced soon. But the deepest learning we will uh, have will be through these diversity salons. Each salon will include an opportunity for attendees to sign up to be part of uh, our discussion groups to explore the speaker's writings. You will be given, I don't know if I have the book. You will be given an opportunity today to receive without charge and have signed by our speaker a copy of his book, Racism Without Racists, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America. We will then come back in November or December for a discussion read. At the end of the event, you may register with our staff. Here's the book. We have 40 copies. First come, first serve, we're going to hold you accountable. Yes, yes. You will be able to register to be part of our discussion group uh, for the first round uh, at the end of this event uh, for the big read. And now for our speaker. Eduardo Boyer Silva is professor and chair of sociology um, at Duke University and president-elect of the American Sociological Association. A distinguished scholar of race, Professor Bonilla Silva gained visibility in the social sciences with his 1997 American Sociological Review, Rethinking Racism Toward a Structural Interpretation, where he challenges social scientists to analyze racial matters from a structural perspective. His research has appeared in journals such as Sociological Inquiry, Racial and Ethnic Studies, Race and Society, Discourse and Society, American Sociological Review, the Journal of Latin American Studies, and many more. To date, he has published five acclaimed books, namely White Supremacy and Racism in the Post-Civil Rights Era, Racism Without Races, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in the United States, which is our big read, White Out, The Continuing Significance of Racism, White Logic, White Minds, uh, White Logic, White Methods, Racism and the Social Science, and The State of White Supremacy, Racism, Governance, and the United States. Professor Bonilla Silva has received many awards, most notably the Louis Kozer uh, Award given by the theory section of the American Sociological Association for theoretical agenda setting 
and the Cox Johnson Frazier Award given by the American Sociological Association to an individual or individuals for their work in the intellectual traditions of these three great African American scholars. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm UVA welcome to Dr. Eduardo Bonilla Silva. <laughs> I always wonder why people clap before they listen to the... <laughs> Maybe you want to take it back after I finish. I'll take it, I'll take it. And I'm not going to do a Trump. I will read my notes. Because when you don't read, you go crazy. Maybe you were crazy from before, but... So good afternoon. It is great to be at UVA my first time. It's a beautiful campus, beautiful city but we're going to talk a little bit about how that beauty is also problematic. <laughs> Almost 40 years, can you hear me? Yeah. Not so good. Not so good? <clears throat> it's on, okay. Better? No? No. No? Okay. This is fancy. <laughs> Would be nice if we have a teleprompter and I can look at it. <laughs> Better now? Yes. Okay. If not, I can project my voice. So almost 40 years after universities began dealing with diversity, and I'm old enough to remember that before being called diversity used to be called multiculturalism. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So now we are facing what I call the diversity blues. In the academy, as well as in corporate America, everyone says that they are for diversity. Yeah? However, <coughs> isolated racist incidents keep happening again and again and again. Wait till spring comes and then fraternity or sorority will do a slave option party or something like that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So despite our self-professed adherence to the idea of diversity, students and faculty of color in campuses across the nation complain about the same things we complained in the 1980s. Things such as a racist climate in the campus, a curriculum that is not inclusive, lack of faculty diversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, why are we having the diversity blues after years of so-called integration. The reason, and I'm going to advance my punchline from the beginning, I want people to know how I'm going to attack, so I'm going to be straight. The reason for the current racial state of affairs in these institutions of higher learning is because diversity initiated a demand of civil rights groups has been transformed into a formalistic thing of limited substantive value. Colleagues has admitted some, and in some cases, many students of color, without changing the racial fundamentals of these institutions. Hence, I'm here to urge all of us, all of you, to work on a deep diversity agenda that places racial justice at the core of the deal. The institutional goal must be transforming these spaces into genuine multicultural ones. <clears throat> to make my case, this is the, yeah. Wow, it works. To make my case, I will do four things. First, I will define this term that we wrestle with, the term racism, and suggest that it's not just a matter of individual Trump-like people. That is a collective problem, and until we address that collective problem, we will not get to the promised land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. Second, I will identify the new racial ideology that shapes how most whites, not all, but how most whites, talk about race in America, namely colorblind racism. Third, I will try to demonstrate, and I spend most of my time doing this, that most of these colleges and universities that we 
called colleges and universities, in truth, should be called HWCUs, <laughs> historically white colleges and universities. And naming things is important, yeah? And lastly, I will conclude by articulating what is to be done. So that in the third century of this great institution of higher learning, you move the goalposts from diversity as a formal bureaucratic thing toward a true deep diversity agenda. Yeah. So for most whites, racism is KKK, neo-Nazis, and more recently, <laughs> many people claim that Donald Trump has some issues. Yeah. Therefore, they regard racism as the irrational belief some people have or the presumed inferiority of others. At the bottom, you have a definition provided by a student who was critical of a story that appeared in the Cavalier Daily a few uh, <coughs> weeks ago regarding the appearance of the N-word <coughs> in the dorm. Yeah? So this student was saying, oh, we should uh, ignore this stuff. This is blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I think his definition is also problematic. In contrast to this common sense definition, I have argued for 20 years that racism should be conceptualized, first and foremost, as structural, and therefore, as a society-wide problem. Racism during slavery and Jim Crow was not about some bad apples, yeah? But about a society partially organized around the logic and practice of race. After all, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Madison, etc., etc., were the, edu the educated elite of their society, and they were into slave owning, yeah? So once the logic and practice of race became part or congealed as part of the polity, all Americans, all of us, became participants of racism, some as beneficiaries and some as the victims of the racial order. And we all participate, whether we like it or not, or are aware of it or not. So I have no patience for someone who tells me, I'm beyond, beyond. Yeah. You cannot be, same as you cannot be beyond the gender order or the class order. Yeah? Therefore, the problem of racism in America then is not about a few prejudiced people. Most of the problem of race at UVA is not about a few prejudiced students, faculty, or administrators. Point two, all the people of color have to contend with old-fashioned prejudiced people ch such as Bill and Ruth every now and then. The dominant practices responsible for contemporary racial inequality and the ideological defense of the current racial order are of a more refined variety. First, the institutional or structural racism of post-civil rights America it is what I have called in my work the new racism to refer to a regime characterized by mechanisms and practices to reproduce racial domination, which in contrast to Jim Crow, tend to be subtle and seemingly beyond race. Yeah? So for example, in schools, we have the creative resegregation of America. Yeah? We used to be formally segregated. We are now creatively resegregated. Yeah? In terms of housing, we used to have signs. No blacks, Jews, Mexicans, etc., allowed in this neighborhood. Today, a combination of practices by realtors who steer clients into different neighborhoods and the banking industry have maintained high levels of residential segregation. In stores, we used to have signs, no blacks, like Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, etc., allowed in this store. Now we have racial profiling, yeah, of a new creative way, such as, I'm a professor at Duke, but I don't go with a sign saying, please treat me differently, I'm a different kind of, you know. Anyway, I will never do that, but some, some of us do it, yeah. Uh, avoiding a pain, racial pain is uh, important in our lives, yeah. So I navigate life as a beautiful black Latino, yeah? which means that I experience what most uh, black folks and Latinos experience in stores. Yeah? So often I am like, may I help you? Just look. A minute later, may I help you? <laughs> may I help you? 
Yes, you can help me. I'm trying to steal this fancy coat. <laughs> and I was wondering if you like it. <laughs> so this new way of reproducing racial order is co-created by the racial ideology. Oh, I forgot to do the commercial. My publisher is going to be mad. <laughs> yeah, got to do it. Yeah. Like I'm Puerto Rican, I ain't got time to be slow. Okay. <laughs> so, so this new ideology is, is a ideology that I have termed colorblind racing, and is organized around the bogus use of the principles of liberalism to explain and justify all kinds of racial matters. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about race, but they all say, well, it is because it is your culture, it is you, it is a, it's not me, it's the market. It's anything but racing. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I, I am not too subliminal, I must confess. Yeah? So in that book, I deconstruct each component of this ideology, but given time constraints, I will only give you one example of the fundamental frame of this ideology, which is the frame of abstract liberalism. So it has four frames, I will only explain one. An abstract liberalism is a frame anchored on uh, accounts for race-related matters with the language of liberalism, but in a theoretical or abstract way, and decontextualized matters. So I will give you one example, and it's an example that you'll be like, but, and that is exactly why I think it's important. So the example is Jim, who is a 30-year-old salesperson, a computer salesperson, who explained his opposition to affirmative action in the following uh, manner. I think it's unfair top to bottom on everybody, and the process, process, it often, you know, discrimination itself is a bad word, right? But you discriminate every day. You want to buy a beer at the store, and there are six kind of beers you can get from natural light to some else, right? And you look at the price, and you look at the kind of beer, and you, it's a choice. And a lot of that you have laid out in front of you. Which one you get? Now. Should the government sponsor some Adams and make it cheaper than natural light because it's brewed by someone in Boston? That doesn't make much sense, right? Why would we want to make Sam Adams eight times as expensive because we want people to buy natural light? Got it? Some did. Probably half of you are still, mm -hmm, let me think about that. So that's the way we talk about race, most of all in the contemporary era. So you still have Trump and some of his followers who are straight and you, yeah, okay, got it, yeah? <laughs> but this is the, the hegemonic way, the dominant way in which we transact race discussions, particularly in the academy, yeah? Mm -hmm. Not exclusively, but particularly, yeah? So Jim assumes that hiring decisions are like market choices. And therefore, so choosing between dif different uh, brands of beer, so he takes a laissez-faire position on hiring, yeah? Hire the best or buy the beer that you think is the best, yeah? The problem with Jean's view, a view shared by most whites in America, is that labor market discrimination is alive and well, and we have estimated that anywhere between a 30 to 50 percent of the time, black and Latino job applicants experience discrimination, okay? We even have a experimental uh, data suggesting that you don't even need to show up for an interview to experience discrimination. If you submit a, a resume and your name is Tyrone or Jose, you are significantly less likely to get the job. The person doing this uh, work, Diva Pager, at, formerly at Princeton, now at Harvard, decided to go one level deeper and said, what if I say, not only they have the same credentials, but I'm going to say that the white applicant has a criminal record. Guess what the finding is? Still advantage white, which is like, Wow, this is for real. <laughs> okay. Furthermore, Jim believes that jobs in America are awarded in meritocratic fashion. Yes? You hire the best. Yeah? That's why we hire George W. Bush, who was the most qualified. <laughs> anyway, we in the social sciences know that anywhere between 80 to 85 percent of uh, of uh, jobs are secured through informal networks, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we do want our students to work hard, and we should tell them that, 
But if we're honest, we need to tell them, if the person sitting by you is last name Rockefeller, <laughs> hi Rocky, how you doing? <laughs> because that network may be more important in your career than anything you learn at Duke or at UVA. So therefore, by ignoring the significant impact of discrimination in the labor market, Jim can safely voice his opposition to affirmative action in a seemingly race-neutral way. Yeah? That's the way we transact race discussions. <clears throat> if I had more time, I would discuss examples of the style of this ideology, yeah? uh, things such as, I call them semantic moves, such as, I'm not a racist, but, or, some of my best friends are black. I don't know their name, but I know they're my best friend. <laughs> but I will address examples of racial stories, yeah? such as uh, the past is the past. Yeah? I didn't own any slaves. Yeah? But my main job today is to account for the diversity blues in HWCUs, and I will stick to that agenda. But if you thirst for more, <laughs> there is a book. <laughs> We seldom ponder about the whiteness of the places we labor or the practices that created and still maintain these institutions of higher learning quite oriented. Instead, we conceive these places in universalistic terms, that is, as just colleges and universities. However, these universities are, in fact, age WCUs and have a history, demography, curriculum, climate, and symbols and traditions that embody, signify, and reproduce whiteness and therefore systemic racism. This organizational reality is responsible for the so called isolated incidents that keep happening again and again and again in these places. Incidents such as in 2012. A sorority dressed up in Mexican costumes at Penn State with signs that read, Will more lawn for wheat and beer, and I don't cut grass, I smoke it. In 2013, members of a Duke fraternity organized an Asian uh, theme party. In 2015, so last year, we had students chanting the Sigma Alpha Epsilon racist chant. This was after the incident in. Oklahoma, some Duke students were repeating the chants. Oh, that's funny. You know? uh, and a noose uh, appeared hanging from a tree. And just last year, 2016, this, is this year, it came to the attention of the university community that, that uh, two years ago, Executive Vice President Talman Trask, the university primary financial and administrative uh, uh, officer, used a racial slur slur after he hit a parking attendant with his car. Now he claimed he didn't hit her. He claimed the car accidentally moved forward at a certain <laughs> speed, you know. And I remember discussing this uh, claim with the president of the university and like, how is that working in a court of law? The bullet accidentally left the gun and accidentally hit the heart of the other person, but it wasn't me. Yeah. Anyway, the incident was reported an internal investigation done, and guess what the internal investigation found? No fault, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and we all know about the various racist incidents at Missouri, ranging from uh, swastikas drawn, drawn in residence halls. You notice the color of that swastika, yeah? You got to be committed to race stuff, to use the <laughs> substance the fellow used to draw this swastika, yeah? And the black president of the student body called the N uh, the, was called the N-word by young folks in a pickup truck. At Yale, the exclusion of women of color from a Sigma Alpha Epsilon Halloween party led to a campus rebellion. And at UVA a few weeks ago, residents of the Kent Danny Dorm Association discovered racial slurs written in permanent marker on several places in the hall. I'm not singling out your institution. I'm giving you the sense that this is across the nation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Actually, I have been associated with like five, six different places in my career. Everywhere that is an HWCU, this stuff keeps happening and happening. So near, now I'm going to pivot. I'm going to make a, a claim, a big claim. These incidents are the expected excretions of HWCUs. 
Nevertheless, and this is key, for every big traditionally racist incident that makes the news, for every fraternity that thinks it is great to have a slave auction, for every case where the campus or city police racially profiles and brutalizes a student or faculty of color, students, faculty, and staff of color routinely face, if I can turn the page, the manifold, more significant, other excretions produced by the organizational and cultural whiteness of HWCUs. But let me be clear. We must tackle, I'm not saying to ignore, the extremist racist behavior of the few in HWCUs. However, meaningful change will not happen until we address the organizational and cultural whiteness of these institutions. That is the foundation of our racial problem. Accordingly, one of the central components of HWCUs we must address is their historical white demography, which profoundly shaped these spaces. On this point, a black student, after having visited an IB Leaf College, described it as follows. One reason I didn't go there was because it reeked of whiteness, and that is no joke. And I'm not exaggerating. I was only there for two days, and after one day, I wanted to leave. And I mean, really, it just reeked everywhere I went. It reeked of all white men, just really whiteness, oozing from the corners. <laughs> I wanted to leave, and I knew that socially, I would just be miserable. And I talked to other black students. I talked to all of them because they're in a lot. And so I said, do you like it here? And they were like, no, we're miserable. <laughs> Another component of HWCUs is a curriculum that reflects the values, history, and position of whites in the world. And I know this statement is controversial, as many people in the academy assume knowledge is pure, objective, and universal. Therefore not affected by class, gender, or race. So on this, uh, to Kufu Suberian, I wrote the book, White Logic, White Methods, where we claim that logic and methodology are also racialized, yeah? That logic and that methodology was used to say that black folks are less smart, culturally deficient, etc. So when you sort of uh, follow the canons, be aware that the canons have been used to justify all kinds of inequities, not only on race, but on gender, yeah? Yet, I am sure few of you would doubt that what passed as history, as the classics, or as philosophy in HWCUs until the 1960s was absolutely biased towards whites and the West. On this, the great black historian, Carter G. Woodson, so wearing his house, so happy, stated in his classic, The Miseducation of the Negro, the following. Most of what universities have taught us economics, history, literature, religion, and philosophy is propaganda. When a Negro has finished his education in our schools, when he has been equipped to begin the life of an Americanized uh, white man, the present system under the control of white trains the Negro to be white, and at the same time convinces him or the impropriety or the impossibility of his becoming white. This is schizophrenic, yeah? Be white, but you can never be. <laughs> you can go to the beach, but don't get wet. <laughs> this curricular concern is a hot issue because most students and faculty of color still believe a lot of the knowledge transmitted in HWCUs is one-sided and not terribly relevant to their experiences and needs. I advocate for a thorough curricular revision in HWCUs with an eye to make sure the courses we offer are racially fair, just, and relevant. But I am not asking for us to stop teaching the so-called canons, yeah? That fight of the 1990s, oh, you want to kill, you know, the death white men, remember that 1990s? That's not my, my, my business. We must teach Kant, even though he had a white supremacist point of view. Yeah? We must teach Jefferson, despite his odious views on African Americans, not of Virginia. And we must teach statistics, despite that many of his developers <coughs> thought of using statistics to validate eugenics. So what I'm asking is that we should discuss the canons 
and we should be open to interpretation and reinterpretation. This is what the universities should be about, always critical, nothing unconditional. Yeah? On this biology, Sandra Harding, in her Science and Social Inequality, had it right when she said, the cognitive diversity generated by cultural local knowledge projects is a great resource for our species. And today I was talking about that uh, with a group of colleagues and talking about uh, giving one example. Think about medicine, yeah? And how 30 years ago we would, many of us, would laugh at acupuncture. <laughs> that's, some, that's some crazy stuff, yeah? Who's going to have needles? In their, uh, that's some Chinese stuff, yeah? And now NIH has shown us that for pain control, for allergies, etc., using acupuncture is more efficient and doesn't have the same side effects of the Western-oriented technologies we have, yeah? We are addicted to opiates, yeah, of all kinds, to deal with pain, emotional and physical, yeah? Well, better than do that, do the acupuncture, yeah? So the point here is diversity of knowledge is important. And we should not basically say that 10% of humanity control all the knowledge, control all the value, control all the, the good stuff. The music, the aesthetics. Think about music. I, I mean, what would be the world if we only con are concerned with the music produced by European folks? Yeah, <laughs> the world is large and it's great if we have diversity of knowledges of all kinds, not only in terms of uh, of medicine but also uh, uh, music, uh, art, etc. HWCUs also have traditions that predate their so-called integration. Many of which are exclusionary, such as homecoming, uh, uh, and some are sort of innocently exclusionary, such as uh, Friday afternoon tea at Smith College. Some of these traditions are highly racialized, as is the case with offensive mascots uh, throughout the US. At times, the defense of these mascots and traditions has the flavor of the defense of the Confederate flag. For example, the University of Illinois after much controversy, and they were pressured by the NAACP to change their mascot, decided to retire its mascot, Chief uh, Elinowick, in 2007. The Board of Trustees, the person in charge of announcing to the world that they had decided to remove the mascot, used this language to express uh, the change. Chief Elinowick was created, <coughs> carried on, and enjoyed by people with great respect for tradition. And we appreciate their decision and dedication and commitment. It will be important to ensure the accurate recounting and safekeeping of the tradition as an integral part of the history of the university. So this is where he's announcing that they're removing it and see the, the emphasis on tradition, yeah? Slavery was also a tradition and some traditions need to be removed. <laughs> This was in February of 2007. By October, the university allowed the symbol to appear in their homecoming. And by 2013, it allowed a group called Honor the Chief Society to sell merchandise and do so-called Indian dances. This stuff was very hot in the beginning of the new millennium. And a group of students at Northern um, Northern Colorado University decided to sort of, okay, let's see, since you think that this is something to be relaxed, what if we do some racist, anti-white stuff? How you react? And they did this, and actually, to their surprise, in the original version, they, they call it fighting whites. And guess what? They put these shirts, and people started asking them, I want to buy it. So all kinds of white supremacy group wanted to, and they decided to change it to fighting whiteies. And they still made like $100,000 out of the transaction. And they donated all the money for fellowships for underrepresented minority students. Um, lastly, HWCUs engender a white ecology culture. The most damaging component of discrimination in higher education, according to uh, my colleague Joe Fagan, or former colleague at Texas A&M, is that, and I quote, the taking for granted by most white administrators faculty, staff, and students that the campus is a white place in which black and other 
others are admitted at, as, as best as guests. This white ecology, bolstered by attitudes, traditions, and quite often by alcohol, is the reason why 25% of minority students report experiencing a hate crime. Yeah? That 25% is an, under, is an underestimate because most of us, let's be honest, do not report these incidents. Yeah. I never reported the incidents that happened to me, both as a student, when I was in Wisconsin as a student, and now as a professor. The white-oriented symbols that adorn HWCUs create an oppressive ecology where just walking on campus is unhealthy for people of color, where we feel, as one observer commented, as guests who have no history in the house they occupy. For example, at UW-Madison, where I studied, they had the, the study of Lincoln, and during graduation, white students jump on his lap, oh, I want the picture with Lincoln. They never saw a black or Latino student doing this, but. <laughs> so Lincoln, the liberator. At Duke, we have a room with uh, the picture of past presidents. I often give talks like this in the president's room, and it's all these old white men. And I'm quick, so I make a comment. I go, oh, this is like white supreme. That's the clan room. And then I begin my talk. And by the time I'm already talk, I say, wait, did he say the clan room? <laughs> <laughs> um, and many of these campuses have the statue of Venus yeah, as a symbol of beauty, meaning white beauty. Yeah? Or they have buildings named after racist people, such as Yale, which had the, still has the John Calhoun Hall. And UVA, founded by Thomas Jefferson, yeah, has his name and image visible throughout the campus. But where are the statues? and buildings honoring Native American, Black, and Latino leaders? Where are the buildings named after important minority educators or leaders? Where are the statues of Black, Native American, Asian, and Latino beauty symbols? Aren't we beautiful too? I think we are. Where are the counter historical symbols or institutional statements to express the honest truth about our founders? So it's not a matter of removing statues. Sometimes we have to, but sometimes it's just a matter of producing alternative interpretations, yeah? So that people know that history is complex. In short, where are the signs making HWCUs look and feel like multicultural environments? This is why we feel as guests who have no history in the house we occupy. Many HWCUs co-create college towns, such as Madison, Wisconsin, or College Station, Texas, I work there too, or Charlottesville, Virginia, that mimic the white flavor of these colleges. Hence, local business, uh, businesses and even town people sort of cater to white mostly interests. Catering mostly to whites may lead to a defending turf mentality when dealing with people of color. For example, some time ago, when my, my son was studying in Wisconsin, an employee at a place called Ed, Ed's Express in Madison approached a group of black students eating dinner and told them, and I quote him, I'm sick of you people leaving piles of shit all over our tables. And then he added, I want you to, to leave the premises. I don't want you here. And you had an incident again a year ago that shows how local police deals and feels about young folks of color. That's a picture of Martiz Johnson. Let me conclude by addressing the burning question of what is to be done. What must leaders, faculty, and students at HWCUs across the nation do to advance a deep diversity agenda? First, we must appreciate that the problem of racism at HWCUs is systemic, rather than a matter of a few prejudiced individuals. The new thinking on diversity must be rooted on this social fact. Accordingly, leaders in HWCUs must work hard to uproot all the practices, traditions, and cultural affectations that help reproduce the W in the HWCUs. 
Second, anyone who says that since racism is a national, and some of us claim international problem, universities cannot do anything until the nation changes, is full of HWCU. <laughs> Precisely because of the unique role of universities as institutions of knowledge production and places willing to experiment, they are in the best position in society to transform themselves into pockets where racial democracy and racial justice can flourish. HWCUs can enact non-reformist reforms with the clear objective of eliminating their white foundation and structure and fostering their transformation into truly inclusive democratic institutions of higher learning. The work will be hard, but HWCUs can reimagine and reinvent themselves. Third, in post-Civil Rights America, whites have created the colorblind racist way of talking about and framing race matters. This has produced a formidable arsenal of words, phrases, and arguments that has given whites the discursive upper hand as they can defend the racial interests in a seemingly non-racial manner. We must fight the everyday colorblind language regular whites use to keep us in our new place. So yes, we must fight whenever someone crosses back to the old language. Important we do that. But that is not the dominant way that most folks talk, think, and process race issues. Fourth, university administrators switch the justification and policy content of programs that were the product of racial struggles or programs that originally were couched as initiatives for achieving racial justice. Okay? On this, I will cite Molana Karenga, director of Black Studies at CSU Long Beach. I met him some years ago. Redefining affirmative action as an issue of diversity rather than justice hides the fact that in a multicultural society, the recognition and respect of diversity is indeed a justice issue. And this recognition and respect can only be expressed and reaffirmed in relations of shared wealth, power, and status, and only achieved and sustained in the storm, thunder, and whirlwind of struggle. <laughs> Sounding here a little bit like Frederick Douglass, yeah? Regardless of reports of current and continuing social sunshine from the smiling weather men and women of the established order and its allies. Hence, we need to do at this juncture what seems almost impossible. We must reframe our diversity programs as sort of reparations, and you don't like the term reparation, call it booba booba, call it whatever you want. Yeah? <laughs> but it's about the business of social justice and fairness, yeah? So this program must be guarantees that we're still in the business of creating a truly multicultural, egalitarian America. Diversity should not be a mere slogan, but a real practical effort to change things rooted in our real commitment to achieve racial parity in America. Finally, and this is hard for academic folks, therefore please bear with me. Getting to the racial promised land of milk and honey will not be the result of good deeds and in, or of enlightened administrators following best practices <laughs> on diversity or the outcome of a diversity and inclusion committee. I was in one of those <laughs> last year. Racial reforms at HU, WCUs have been the product of struggles, let's be honest, which is why protests at Missouri, Yale, UVA, Duke, etc., are so important. They are the spaces that then produce, so I'm going to believe that most of your administrators want to do better. And we need to help them by organizing and fighting. Because when we organize and fight, they cannot then do what they tend to do, which is, you know, the donors don't like that, the donors don't like this, but when you have a rebellion in their hands, then it's easier for them to say, we got to do this, yeah? So
So we have to do our part. Attaining deep diversity will not be easy. But as a Chicago politician once said, yes, we can reimagine our colleges. Yes, we can <laughs> transform HWCUs into pockets of anti-racism and true universalism. And yes, we can remove the W from our HWCUs. And when we do these things, then all of us, white, black, brown, and Asian, will be proud of our colleagues and universities, as they would then be examples of the beloved community Dr. Martin Luther King dream about. Thank you. So thank you, Eduardo, for that. You have no idea, but you probably do, <laughs> how important that talk is and how um, prescient it is for us at UVA. So it is time for Q&A. We have microphones that will be floating about. This is the time for us to really engage in this collective dialogue. So please. Yes. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. It's not on. Yeah. It's not on. Yeah. I can hear okay. you. Yeah. I think there we go. Okay. Um, is this better? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you for so much for your talk. Um, I followed some of your work, and it's really exciting to hear from you in real life. Uh, in your last point, you brought up something that I was hoping you could further expand upon, which is. Um, I still study or read so many psychology papers where the word prejudice and race are used interchangeably. And I think one big reason something like that keeps happening is because as a society, especially in the social sciences, we keep pushing for quantitative and experimental methodologies. And that's expanded upon onto you know, the university level with the words like best practices, evidence-based practices. And implicit in all of those, is that experimental knowledge is the only form of knowledge. And when we do those kind of things, you can't really experiment you know, like conditions of race the same way you could, you know, I guess when, yeah, I guess I was hoping you could expand upon it's the tension. A simple, it's a simple and a convenient formula, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, prejudice is a matter of individual, individuals infected with the disease, yeah? And, they tend, and we have like 70 years of making the argument since the work of Theodore Adorno, authoritarian personality, where he articulated the view that has remained with us, which is the view of the racist. Yeah? And the racist is who? A poorly, how does Donald Trump call these films? <laughs> the poorly educated, the southern working class, white uh, uh, folks. Yeah. So it's a convenient formula because then uh, elite members of the white community are not part of the drama. Yeah? The drama is limited to this pocket. And we also have, in that uh, diagnostic statistical term, we also have the solution. If the problem is ignorance, the solution is what? Education. And we're in HWCUs, and we have been doing this education for a long, long time. And it looks like it's not working too well. The alternative to this then is moving, and I, by the way, I don't take the approach that we should not do a lot of quantitative work on race matters. We do need data, but I want to ex expand that, and data needs to always be informed by the best social theory. So the social theory of thinking of racism, not prejudice, as the core, is a different paradigm, yeah? So when you're in the racism paradigm, you have to deal with social relations in which we all participate, yeah? It's a much, much more efficient, in my view, but dangerous position. Therefore, I'm not surprised that most uh, members of the academy that want to be beyond, beyond, yeah? we're beyond race, class, gender, yeah? We are perfect, yeah? We have nothing to do. It's people out there, yeah? We are 
in these beautiful spaces where nothing happens except knowledge, yeah? Except that that is anti-sociological. We're social animals, and therefore we're affected by the same forces. Let me use the language of the 50s. The same social forces that are out there are in here, mm -hmm. and we, it cannot be otherwise, yeah? Changing the paradigm, which I have been trying for 20 years, has proven more difficult because the ideology of racism is prejudice is almighty. It's convenient. And it keeps, like Freddy Krueger, reemerging on their new names, yeah? So a variation of that is the new language of um, Hillary Clinton used it the other day. The what? Implicit bias. Implicit bias, yeah? So the problem is implicit bias. We all have implicit bias. And we need to deal with some kind of therapy yeah, to deal with the unconscious bias that we all have. The problem is with that articulation that when we then ignore the very practical, visible ways in which race affects everything. Mm -hmm. I don't need implicit bias to know that race matters. Yeah? And I'm not saying that there is not implicit bias. I am not even saying that it doesn't affect all of us. It is true that uh, these uh, tests show that many of us, folks of color, are also affected by this implicit bias, and I'm not surprised. The same racial culture that we all, we all breed the same racist culture, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, gee, I'm afraid of that black fellow. I'm black too, oh, I'm afraid of, my, I'm afraid of myself. I, you know, okay, let me not look at myself in the mirror, yeah? So anyway, long-winded answer to tell you that this theoretical uh, debate has obviously mm -hmm. political repercussions, and the only, to crack the, the social scientific a discursive deal will also deal with society because that same view of, so, of in the social sciences is also normative out there. If you ask top of your head, folks, what is racism? And they'll give you a version of, oh, those people, yeah, the irrational people, yeah? What the, what the Virginia student said in his own self-made definition is not too different from a textbook definition of racism. Okay, next. That's it. Come on, folks. Go for it. David Green. <clears throat> um, I've always been curious attending schools in the South, right? Because you know, you look now and you see you know large populations of minority students on the East Coast in Virginia attending schools, ODU, VCU. Uh, Hampton, you know, you know, basically you've got the history there. And then you get to Central Virginia and you see, you know, basically you know the history where, you know, coming out of 1865, you're talking about large swaths that were, you know, 6, 50, 60 percent African American because of the slave population. So there's always been diversity in, you know, these states, especially in the South. Um, so I get curious in terms of like, you know, looking at, I guess, the theory, which, you know, I'm still, you know, as an engineer, I like theory, but still try to grasp with it, but just the practice, when, you know, you're looking at having these conversations, oftentimes these are, you know, positions of power struggles, you know, they're, well, I don't know that person. And, you know, that becomes, you know, a convenient way to keep things the way they are. So I'm just curious, you know, you look at change and you see, you know, oftentimes, okay, I don't feel I'm that old, but, you know, I look at when I was 20 and I had more to gain by coming in and saying, hey, you know, so, I mean, in terms of that, that movement, I mean, where do you see things going, one, and then two, I mean, we're an institution like UVA that has been historically the way it is, now, you know, surrounded by diversity, how do those people actually get in and how do you keep them how, here? Yeah. Have, you, the have you asked me the same question three years ago, I would have told you something like this. I am pessimistic about the future. Because at the time I was, that tells you the predictive or lack of predictive power, the sociological imagination. Even as president elect, I'm going to admit, admit in public my limitations. So my argument would have been that most uh, young black and brown folks are out to lunch. They don't know our own history. They didn't participate in a social movement, which explained why they thought that the Obama was a social movement. It's like social movement, man. This is democratic, traditional party politics as they come. It's nothing radical, revolutionary about that. And then Black Lives Matter movement emerged. I'm like, whoop, I need to read, think my, my argument. And also the college movement that became sort of national last year, yeah? 
that was uh, unexpected. I guess that I had to go back to Social Movement 101. <laughs> uh, we in the social movement uh, tradition are good ex post facto. Yeah? We write beautiful books after the movement, but mm -hmm. our predictive capacity is not that, uh, it's not that good. So the, the moment is important. Uh, the combination of forces, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, combined with the students on college campuses, combined with perhaps the most serious fracture of your generation, millennials, uh, doubting about the radicalism and progressive uh, nature of the Democratic Party, which I think is fundamental. If we're going to crack the knot politically, we got to push that, uh, that donkey as hard as we can. And if not, then create a third party, a different animal. I like the panther as an animal, for, <laughs> as a symbol for that party. But whatever animal we choose collectively, I'm fine with that. But fighting between elephants and, and donkeys has not been good to us. And I think that in, the la, in, the la, in this particular election, for the first time, we see young folks saying, I, I ain't going to play for that. Yeah? And, uh, so combining both social movement politics, which I think is central to social change, with a distrust of traditional party politics. Trump is wrong in many things, but he was, he's not wrong in saying that we, folks of color, have been controlled and the Democratic Party comes to our communities every four years. Vote for me because the other people are fascist. I'm like, what have you done for me? What are we, why are we Latinos supporting Obama when he was our deporter in chief? Yeah, even though he promised. And go back to the data. In 2008, he was elected because of the Latino vote because the Latino vote in Colorado, New Mexico, and I forgot the third state. We were central to his victory. And he promised, in my first year, I'm going to give you immigration reform. And what did he deliver? Zero. So I, just think, I think it's important that we finally are moving a little bit away from symbolic politics. Yeah? So it's good, and we feel good when we see a, a black man in the White House. But we need to always remember that the White House is still a White House. So having a black guest doesn't change the nature of the politics coming out of the White House. And it is a moment in which we can then transform the political landscape by doing both the combination of social movement political activity combined with, if we're going to do party politics, we're going to do a new, a new deal, yeah? No more of this, okay, on the Republican side, we have this bad dude. And on the Democratic side, we have the lesser of two evils. I'm tired of supporting evil, yeah? Mm -hmm. I want to support goodness. I want to support uh, politics that feed the moment, yeah? So that's what I think is the, the exciting uh, opportunity. Will the opportunity develop into a national uh, discussion and political moment that will produce fundamental transformation in the racial order of things? Not just in the South, but in the... People forget, you know, we're in the South and and we got this stigma, yeah? yeah? The South is the South. The South is, <laughs> it begins in, in the US. It begins in the border with Canada. That was a joke by, <laughs> by Mal Malcolm X. And when I, when I heard the joke, I was like, he didn't know much about Canada. Because Canada is also an extremely racialized country, yeah? So, so again, I see the opportunities. I cannot, have, I, I cannot look at my crystal ball and tell you, because of that, fundamental change on the, on the racial front will emerge. I do know that this is a moment that has not, uh, we haven't had anything similar in the last 20 years. The word. Um, you posited the idea of, um, that the American racial hierarchy would sort of be sort of uh, Latin Americanized. Uh, and then Jennifer Lee, uh, Howard, Frank Bean, and I think Howard Tells responded mm -hmm. and argued that um, uh, that it would actually be, uh, be a non-black and black divide. Do you still think, uh, do you agree with them? Um, and what do you think the implications are for um, black America um, in um, if this sort of non-black and black divide does happen and their relation, black America's relations to other minority groups? I agree with myself. <laughs> Let me do uh, Donald Trump. I agree with myself. So this is an inside the, the game uh, uh, question, yeah? So some years ago, I argued 
that race stratification in the U.S. was moving in a Latin American-like direction, and that uh, involved developing a tripartite racial order with a group at the top, the usual suspects, whites, which I claim will be refueled and re-energized by the admission in the white team of new identities, yeah? And that included some people that today may be Latino or Asian, may become white. And then a group at the bottom that I call, and in that there is a similarity with my argument with Jennifer Lee, which is I said the majority will be what I call the collective black, yeah? And the collective black then included uh, uh, historical black folks, although some of the historical black folks are moving in another category. I'll talk about the other category in a GIFI. Um, it, it will include a lot, some Asian Americans here. Yeah? It will include most Latinos, most Native Americans, not all, yeah? And I said that there will be a, an important space in the middle that I call honorary whites. Again, following the Latin American tradition that there is always an in-between group fundamental to understand race stratification in Cuba, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Peru, etc. You have to understand that middle group that plays a strong game of I'm not black or Indian, I am Peruvian, I'm Puerto Rican. And you push them, they're like, I'm sort of just Cuban, that's it, yeah? And that group has been historically extremely important in maintaining racial order because they can buffer racial conflict, yes? It is those people who are a problem most of us are okay. So I think that her thesis and mine will not be fully tested until we are, in, until like 30, 40 years. By then, I'll probably be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Mary, we're talking to the planner. He said, and after 95, no more money. I was like, 95, man, I'm going to be like Matusale. I'm going to be like in a long, long time. Uh, at any rate, uh, I think it's important for us to begin thinking about this uh, group that I call honorary whites. I think it's important for us to begin thinking about a group that I have been calling in my Facebook writing. It's liberating sometimes, yeah, Facebook is like a space that you can say all kinds of stuff, yeah. Um, I, the group that I call the false positives, yeah. So in the academy, we struggle for diversity, yeah, rightly so. And now, we may get diversity that doesn't accomplish the, the goal, yeah? What good is for us to get an anti-Latino Latino, an anti-black black, an anti-woman woman, and at least in the short term, we don't have even the language to say, oh, she doesn't count because she really is anti-women, yeah? Or she is an anti-black black. So in the short term, not understanding this false positive is going to uh, produce a lot of problems and limitations for us because they are the ones that are getting a lot of the, of the jobs and after they get the job they stay on for 30 years. So, so lacking the politics of how to deal with honorary whites and false positives in the year 2016 will be part of the drama, particularly in, in both corporate America and college campuses for the next 30, 40 years. We still, I'm going to be honest, we don't have even the language to talk about that, yeah? How do we have a discussion in a hiring committee about, well, that black person is, <laughs> that's like a Clarence Thomas. I don't want that Clarence Thomas, you know? And we don't have it in part because of the nationalism within our communities, yeah? Mm -hmm. Nationalism is a double-edged sword. My wife claims it's not. It's always bad, she does. <laughs> Except when Puerto Rican nationalism is different. <laughs> Do you have any Puerto Rican in the group? Not a single Puerto Rican? We have Puerto Rico. Very good. Se vende mofongo aquí? Mofongo is a beautiful thing. Anyway, so, so to summarize, basically, I think that the future of race stratification is becoming more complex. Whether it's going to be the Jennifer Lee expectation or the Eduardo Bonilla Silva expectation, this much we can say. It will not be the race traditions that we had for 200 years. It will be something different, whether it's the Latin America-like tradition or the Jennifer Lee argument of black, non-black divide. I want to wrap us up and say that this is the beginning of a year-long conversation and hopefully a multi-year conversation at UVA. We have ready for you racism without racism, <laughs> and all you need to do is agree to read the book 
and then join us in a conversation. So they will be outside, and Dr. Bonilla Silva has agreed to sign them. We can continue our conversation outside. Let us all give a warm thank you for Dr. Silva.